Well, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar today on exploring the value of cloud ERP, uh, talking about our outdated systems uh, and manual processes holding your finance team back. Uh, my name is Ethan Haberman, and I'll be uh, working uh, through today's session with you today. Um, just a quick introduction uh, on myself. Uh, so I've worked here at iBailey for about the last three and a half years uh, as a solutions consultant uh, on our NetSuite team. So my role is to work with clients, uh, understand their current business environments, and, and how we can uh, help them enhance or optimize their uh, operations or outcomes um, using cloud ERP software. So my background uh, has been uh, in IT. I've spent a good portion of the last 15 years um, working with business systems with the last seven of those working specifically with ERP on our NetSuite team. I am a certified NetSuite consultant and also uh, a member of the Institute of Management Accountants. I do live outside of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which uh, if you're not familiar, it's just outside of Spokane, Washington uh, with my wife, Lindsay, our two little boys, Wesley and Bennett. We've got two dogs, a cat and seven little chickens. So um, looking forward to working today, uh, uh, work, working with you guys today, um, talking about cloud ERP. So um, just to talk a little bit about um, our agenda today, uh, first I think what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how the role of finance has changed and how that has evolved in today's business environment. And we'll talk about how to identify, or, or we're going to identify the benefits of cloud ERP uh, to support changing business needs. We'll then outline the difference between cloud ERP and traditional software, and then go through some uh, areas and, and maybe some telltale signs that you've outgrown your current accounting system. And then lastly, we'll talk about how and discuss how to evaluate what might be the right ERP for you um, moving forward. If we do have time at the end, we'll do a quick product demonstration, show you a little bit about some of the, the dashboards and, and uh, productivity tools that some of the modern cloud ERPs have to offer, uh, and then do some Q&A. So to kick us off, let's explore how the role of finance has evolved over time. So first off, the, the, the CFO is now really an in integral part of a company's digital transformation. And when we talk about digital transformation, I know that's a buzzword that's out there a lot right now. What does that really mean? It could be spelled out really eloquently uh, by uh, MIT pr uh, principal research scientist, George Westerman, talking about digital transformation really marks a radical rethinking of how an organization uses technology, people, and processes to fundamentally change their business performance. For many CFOs, uh, leading a digital transformation is just a natural progression. During the last decade, uh, responsibilities of their role have really expanded beyond traditional financial and accounting oversight into areas requiring the skills of, of really a catalyst and a, a strategist. Um, there was a, a Q2 uh, survey done by Deloitte that said uh, 47% of 172 CFOs from large North American companies. So uh, companies that are more than a billion dollars in revenue, revenue said they either had direct responsibility for strategic planning or through someone who reports to them. In addition, 36% of CFOs indicated they had responsibility for IT with 30% citing direct reporting. CFOs also rated IT as the most likely function to be added to the responsibilities in the future. Also, um, they're having <clears throat> more responsibility in implementing tech for finance. Uh, CFO Research recently surveyed 200 CFOs, senior executive, uh, senior finance executives, and CEOs about their technology adoption for finance, along with how they were using automation, the benefits they perceive, and when they might find success in future adoptions. So, reducing manual, time-consuming processes was a priority for 90% of these executives. For 51% of these executives, improving efficiency, reducing manual tasks, and removing time spent on manual tasks were top priorities for finance, allowing them to support uh, business continuity and resilience of their organizations. Now, to contrast that, uh, improving cost-saving opportunities was only a top priority for 32% of those same respondents. So how are CFOs and finance pro uh, uh, professionals spearheading data analytics? So with evolving and connected technologies like Cloud ERP, which we're going to talk about today, finance professionals have the ability to be proactive in providing the organization with important analytics across the enterprise. For example, at a recently interviewed $200 million food manufacturer, finance led a spend analytics initiative that created some supply chain efficiency and reduced costs by improving management of supply chain sourcing. 
So finance, all they did was develop analytic models and looked at product level profitability, brought those insights forward to help operations better understand the types of decisions that they could do to help reduce costs. Finance crossed over into decision-making traditionally outside of its function by using these analytic solutions, sourcing data from their cloud ERP to evaluate sourcing and suppliers, other sorts of things like lead times, and then deployed that data to buyers on a monthly basis by each one of their product lines. Other areas in which finance supported analytics can help drive value outside of finance, traditional finance function include procurement, so doing spend analysis and vendor management, business unit reporting, so looking at market erosion analysis, pricing analytics, sales and marketing, you know, so looking at price points, customer retention, maybe if you're in software, looking at churn analysis, or even in supply chain, linking in sales and finance uh, to, together to help in those forecasting and that modeling um, to help uh, do additional analysis there. Also, lastly, talking about how the, the shift of, um, of finance has, has really come to the CFO's office is around automation. And I know automation is another one of those buzzwords like, uh, uh, like digital transformation, um, but there's a couple of very concrete um, sorts of examples of, of how automation can play a role in, in finance uh, and how cloud ERP can be a catalyst for that. So two examples of that is what you call robotic process automation. And what is that? You know, you hear that a lot um, these days in terms of how that is being brought into organizations. Um, so what that is, is essentially applying of technology using logic and inputs to help automate business process. So as an example, think about bank reconciliation, something that every finance professional has to deal with in some way or another. Um, it's time consuming because it involves dealing with numerous locations or business entities, different payment methods, vendor payments are comprised of different time and payment methods. Um, so as an example, you can have a robotic process automation that's deployed that will automatically log into your bank accounts, automatically log into your ERP, extract the appro uh, appropriate information from a bot, uh, from your general ledger, cross-reference cross those balances from bank statements to your general ledgers and help you prepare bank reconciliation statement, all based on logic and other sorts of things that can be structured inside of a cloud ERP. The second of these can be things like um, machine learning. So uh, using algorithms inside of your financial software um, to uh, allow them to be trained to identify patterns. Um, so both of these are things that have matured to the point which now they can become key financial technologies used by modern CFOs. So as an example, you know, what does machine learning for someone that's working in accounting? That could be uh, helping you accelerate the financial close process through reconciliation, maybe identifying dynamic discounting opportunities with suppliers and making appropriate recommendations based on data that's sitting in the system, or improving collections and cash flows by predicting when customers might pay late or default based on prior history and other sorts of parameters about that customer. So now why is this important when it comes to talking about cloud ERP? And why this is important is because most often traditional on-premise ERP applications are difficult to integrate to and new advanced tools like we just alluded to with machine learning and robotic process aut automation are not gonna be compatible with traditional ERP applications. Because cloud ERP is inherently open and built on newer technology, these sort of applications can either already be or are already built into these platforms or can be integrated into cloud ERP applications. Okay, let's take a look at our first polling question. So our first polling question is talking about, um, based on a recent survey, what was the top challenge facing the uh, CFO or the finance office in 2020? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next screen here. Um, and so what this is going to show here is based on the survey, what were those top five challenges? And keep in mind, these are out of 14 different options that were given. These were the top five. The first of those being at 51% showing juggling too many responsibilities, managing cash flow, followed by developing accurate financial scenarios. Uh, producing timely accurate reports and implementing tech um, for finance. So as you can see, out of these top five options, four of those are directly related to ERP and financial accounting related things, which is why this is very important as you're moving forward in the role of Office of, of, of Finance. So how does uh, cloud ERP help 
me support my changing business needs. So what are the benefits of, the, of, of a cloud ERP? So as you can see in this graphic, ERP is the center of this wheel. So finance is really the core of ERP, but utilizing what we call a unified data model, uh, cloud ERP has the ability to serve a wide variety of difference, whether you're in healthcare, manufacturing, distribution, maybe you're a service-based company, or maybe you sell software, whatever you might do, um, those are things that can be brought into a cloud ERP with the, with the accounting and the GL really being the core of all of that. Cloud ERP is something that's going to be scalable. So when we talk about scalability, um, we, there's two different ways we look at scalability. You can either scale up or you can scale down and you can also scale out. And so what does that mean? So if we're needing to scale up, that means we are growing. And growth can be an increase in headcount. It can be an increase in transactions. It can be an increase in the number of entities that we're managing. And as we know, um, as our company grows, we are going to be processing more transactions. Most businesses are looking to grow, so it makes sense to ensure that your company is ready for it. When you're choosing an ERP application, you'll include a full exploration of its pro proven processing capabilities. This will ensure that your business will never have to worry about handling future data volumes. And as you know, financial transactions don't just have transactions just don't happen by themselves. A single transaction is only a step in a particular business flow and leads to several more downstream transactions. For example, let's say you're a distribution company entering in a sales order. And that might just think like one, it's going to be one additional transaction, but it's going to generate a lot more downstream transactions as well. So in the sales order example, there could be multiple invoices, multiple shipments, receipt of payment, application of payment. So just for a single sales order, that could create seven to additional transactions. Additionally, um, because uh, cloud ERPs are typically modular, it's going to allow you to scale out to add functionality. So what does scale out actually mean? So that could be thing like uh, adding manufacturing uh, features to a distribution client, or per perhaps your current business model is uh, only for manufacturing and sales of a certain product, but in the future, you want to expand to offer installation services as well. So your current ERP system may not have a services module or a feature set that will allow you to take advantage of this without dis disrupting your current manufacturing process. You could either purchase another software package to handle selling and providing the installation services, but eventually these disparate systems will need to exchange data. This would require typically a custom and expensive interface or an internal external IT team dedicated to managing these connections or databases. The ability to add new features or modules without affecting current business processes is a key indicator of whether an ERP solution will scale out with your business. Additionally, it's going to take a platform approach to allow for rapid development and deployment of company specific solutions. So we're going to talk and use the word platform a lot today. And what does that actually mean? And so a platform, when we think about cloud ERP, offer a, offers a development environment where you can build additional functional uh, functionality into it or on top of the ERP. This could be through the use of workflows, integrations to other applications, or even building applications inside of your ERP. So if you have technical expertise on your team, you can easily extend the functionality of the ERP without buying uh, additional products. You're also gonna have the ability to reduce risk. So you're gonna remove reliance on tribal knowledge uh, of business systems infrastructure. We often run into clients uh, who have a single IT person who manages their um, infrastructure, uh, that manages their backups. And if that person uh, you know, ever leaves the organization, um, then you are going to have issues in terms of being able to replicate um, the work that they're doing or have a, an understanding of how that infrastructure is, is controlled or, or uh, accessed. You're also going to improve data security, system reliability, and uptime. You know, cloud ERPs are going to have uh, multiple data centers. You're going to have backups, disaster recovery, multiple data centers. Um, and so you're going to have the ability to um, have that peace of mind that your data is going to be uh, safe, uh, for not only from a cybersecurity perspective, but then also from a backup and redundancy standpoint as well. There actually was a recent survey that 50% of small to medium sized companies that suffered a total data loss from an ERP perspective due to insufficient backup routines or cyber attacks go out of business within six months. Also this uh, managed service provider, uh, so whoever's gonna be the company that you're using as your cloud ERP, they're gonna be responsible for compliance with regulations. 
So if you think about things like GDPR or PCI compliance or other sorts of regulatory requirements, those are things uh, that working in conjunction with your cloud provider uh, that are going to be uh, managing this, those processes for you. And then lastly, it's going to allow you to focus your human capital resources on your core competency and strategic goals instead of just maintenance on your existing ERP system. And then lastly, tying in a little bit from before from a risk perspective, um, another benefit of cloud ERP is high availability and performance. So you're gonna have real-time access to your data anywhere, anytime, any device. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the ability to access your data, um, especially in the day of remote work um, is critically important. And so anywhere that you have a web browser, you're gonna be able to log into a cloud ERP and get access to your data. It's also going to en enable visibility to business intelligence and transactional data in multiple geographies, languages, and different legislation. So as companies start to expand globally, um, you're going to have that availability regardless of where you are in the world um, from a business standpoint. You're also not going to be dependent on hardware specifications. Um, this allows a lot for bringing of your own device. As long as, again, you have that web browser, there's not going to be anything that has to be installed on your local workstation and no server infrastructure that's going to need to be maintained. And also performance is going to be dependent only on the speed of your internet connection. We oftentimes hear clients that talk about, you know, anytime I do a check run, it slows my whole system down, or, or I can't even use it because my file's gotten too big. Those are just things that you aren't going to have to deal with from a cloud ERP perspective. So I know we've talked a little bit about some of the benefits of cloud ERP and talked about a little bit about how the change of, 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 of uh, finance has in that process. But, you know, what are some of the differences, you know, talking about when we're thinking about cloud ERP and when we're thinking about traditional ERP software. So first, let's talk about some of the challenges that we see in traditional on-premise software. The first of those being version lock. So ERP version lock really occurs when a, a version of the ERP that you're running has been customized so much that it's no, pro, no longer practical to upgrade to a newer version due to the risk that those customizations will break become or, uh, or become an incompatible during that process. Or maybe you haven't upgraded in so long that it's no longer a possibility to upgrade without completely doing a rip and replace. You're also going to have the lack of ability to innovate on, on typically on these uh, uh, on-premise ERP uh, applications. So gone are really the days of IT solely being in charge of the organization's hardware and software. More than ever, IT should really be a critical component of business's overall strategy and work side by side with every department to streamline processes and operations. But when you're running an out of date ERP, the IT resources are typically overloaded with reactive tasks like troubleshooting, doing fixes, managing support tickets around that, not really leaving any time to actually innovate and make things better. It's also going to be expensive to maintain and understand your total cost of ownership. So it's really hard to understand all the, the costs of, of an on-premise ERP because there's hardware and software costs. There's the risk management side of things to those vulnerabilities, upgrades, security patches, backups, multiple data centers, if that's a need and things of that nature. And then just the personnel and other related costs to actually take on those different responsibilities. It also see an issue from a scalability perspective. It's more difficult to, uh, uh, to scale an on-premise ERP since it's managed locally um, with dedicated servers, and that has become easily now with more virtualized servers, but still having to add resources is more difficult and does require IT resources and oftentimes capital investments as you are scaling your business up um, from a size perspective. And as we talked about before, a lot of the times they're different, um, have a disparate databases. So oftentimes with traditional ERP, um, these databases are going to be separate. So your ERP da database might be separate from your CRM database, which might be separate from what's managing your manufacturing database. And so having those all in a single database um, really helps from a, a drill down perspective, financial reporting uh, mixed with operational reporting to really get rid of those data silos. Uh, and then lastly, just the lack of real-time business intelligence. So really for us to compete today from a business perspective, we need a modern ERP with modern business intelligence and analytics tools. So having real-time data that's up to date, um, again, across that unified data model with different areas of your business is critical for success. Uh, employees really need to have role-based KPIs, drill down capabilities uh, with the ability to make smarter, more informed decisions um, basically, you just really can't afford not to have real-time data in today's business climate. 
So what are some of the, uh, the costs? You know, I said so, some of the times it's hard to quantify some of these, but you know, what do we typically see when, um, uh, from a traditional on-premise ERP perspective when it comes to cost? First off, there's gonna be the cost of the actual procurement of the software. So what does it take to buy the software? This is pretty standard when procuring uh, any type of software. Then you're gonna have implementation. When, when, whatever the product or reseller cost is going to be to implement the software in your environment. Uh, then typically yearly maintenance, anywhere from 10 to 25% of what the cost of the software was, is typically charged uh, in, in maintenance as part of this. And also just maintenance from your own perspective. So doing database optimization, re-indexing, other things of that nature. Um, so these are things that we have to account for when we're thinking about the cost of traditional uh, ERP. And then there's fixes. So those security patches and upgrades we talked about, or periodic new features and upgrades, you'll have to do these yourself or pay a partner to do them for you to actually complete these upgrades. And then there's downtime. So downtime for any organization usually means a direct impact to operations and potential financial implications. This could either be planned or unplanned downtime, you know, depending on um, what's happening. And then lastly, performance tuning. You know, as your system continues to grow, both in data stored in the system and functionality that's added, your ERP book, uh, publisher, your implementation partner, or your own IT resources will need to tune the system so it continues to operate quickly and efficiently. So really the reality of this is these are gonna be more expensive uh, systems to maintain. Forrester Research re recently did a study and on average saw that when attempting to calculate the maintenance cost of a uh, on-premise ERP in comparison to cloud, on-premise ERP was on average five times more expensive to maintain per license than a cloud ERP. The Aberdeen group found that two thirds of businesses reported being version locked. They were too afraid or unable to upgrade their ERP to the latest version, leaving them exposed from a security perspective and not allowing them to take advantage of new features, enhancements and updates. Gartner found in a 2020 survey that when having to maintain an on-premise legacy ERP, that the average organization spent 90% of their time and resources on system maintenance instead of innovation. And then lastly, while sometimes more difficult to quantify, disconnected tools among accounting, distribution, sales and support always wreak havoc on operations and organizational efficiency. So let's talk a little bit about the modern uh, cloud ERP. So one of the things that you're gonna see here is you're gonna have economies of scale. And, and so what does that mean? So because cloud vendors manage all of their customers on a single instance of the software, they have the ability to amortize their infrastructure related costs over thousands of customers. So this results in substantial economies of scale and skill, reducing the total cost of ownership for the customers uh, who deploy their business management solutions. It's also going to, to permit growth without that additional infrastructure investment we've talked about. So to a point that was referenced earlier, as you add new functionality or increase your transaction or user load, you won't have to allocate more physical resources or buy new hardware. It's also going to allow you to focus on core competencies instead of managing IT investment. So many organizations lack sufficient IT staffing or cannot afford the same resources and infrastructure as cloud providers. While an organization may be decently skilled at IT, it's, it's not necessarily its core competency. So cloud technology allows organizations to outsource their IT function in this area to focus on their core business. So retailers, for example, typically like to dedicate more uh, focus to customer experience and clientele than IT maintenance. Cloud ERP is also going to be versionless. So what does this mean? If we think about an example of this in the consumer world, think about the scenario of an app on your cell phone. Let's say you have the Facebook app on your phone. Do you know what version of Facebook app that's on your phone? Probably not. It is still updated periodically with new features, fixes, and enhancements, but that's all managed by Facebook and automatically deployed to your phone on a periodic basis. It's also going to have a unified database. And we've talked about this a little bit already, but regardless of the function of what you're doing within the ERP, it's all relying on that single database to access and report that data. This allows you to not have to worry about those data silos we talked about or integrations, depending on what business process you're working on. And also, as we touched before, cloud ERPs are almost always platform based, meaning that you can have platform tools like workflows, integration APIs, or building out those full applications on your ERP platform, or simply add user defined fields, reports, or even data that isn't available out of the box with ERP can easily be added um, using these different platform tools. And in terms of mobility, I don't think we can emphasize this point enough. Modern uh, ERPs are mobile, there's no need for VPN. 
remote access servers, local clients, opening up ports on your, on your corporate firewall. Security can still be maintained through things like two-factor authentication and controlled access, but it's going to allow for easy collaboration with your customers, vendors, and partners through the use of online portals, giving them access to relevant data, and improving the exchange of data to help, help enhance some of those relationships. And then those, that insightful reporting we talked about. So experts have been telling us for years that every company now is a data company. Having real-time relevant information by role at your fingertips is really a core competency of modern cloud ERPs. So we talked about the traditional ERP costs. You know, what are the typical costs when it comes to modern cloud ERP? So the first of those is going to be the subscription. So modern ERP systems are almost exclusively software as a service, commonly referred to as SaaS. This is what gives you access to the system and any functionality that you provision within your ERP instance. These subscriptions will usually be, you know, one year, three year, five year with built in renewal caps, which gives you that cost predictability, oftentimes up to seven years out. You're also going to still have implementation costs, just as traditional ERP, modern cloud ERP is going to have an implementation cost. Those are going to be based on your business processes being implemented training, user acceptance testing, data migration, and support after go live. And then customizations and integrations. If you have business processes that do require customization, these costs are typically a part of that implementation and are provided by an implementation partner. Alternatively, if you do have capable IT staff, training and or self-learning can take place to help complete uh, any of those customizations you may need using internal resources. I think it's one, important to note one thing. Customizations are done at a level above the ERP code from a technical perspective. So they are going to survive all upgrades and patches, keeping you from that version lock we talked about that you can fall to from a, a traditional on-premise ERP perspective. And then similarly with uh, integrations, cloud ERPs offer both out-of-the-box integrations with other applications, or those new integrations can be built either by an implementation partner or internal resources. So as you can see, all of those other costs that were identified as traditional ERP costs are not costs that are going to be incurred as they are completely or completed by the cloud ERP vendor uh, and included in your subscri subscription cost. So you're not going to be worrying about doing um, hardware maintenance, fixes, uh, other things of that nature. You don't have to buy the software outright to start, um, as most of them are uh, using that SaaS model. So uh, most of that cost, as you're going to see here on the next slide, is going to be costs that we call uh, above the surface. So really the key difference here, and this graphic illustrates well, is the cost structure of both on-premise and cloud ERP, um, you can see here as we've outlined. Uh, as finance professionals continue to need better cost predictability, we can see here that cloud ERP is going to give us a much better sense of cost as those costs are much more concrete as opposed to the costs that sit beneath the surface and are difficult to forecast and to track. One key point that I wanna make sure that we articulate here is the difference between hosted ERP and what we would consider true cloud ERP. Now, I know we've talked a lot about today about the difference between traditional ERP and cloud ERP, but we haven't really spent much time talking about the two different kinds of traditional ERP. So the first of those is traditional on-premise ERP, which is what we often refer to as just traditional ERP. The application is installed in your data center on your servers and typically accessed either locally or through a remote access service like Citrix or remote desktop. The other kind of traditional ERP is what we call a single tenant hosted ERP. This is essentially the same architecture as on-premise ERP, except for it's just been put it into a hosted environment like AWS or Azure. There really isn't a fundamental difference between these two other than where the service is or where the server is located. And really the this is different fundamentally than what we would consider true cloud ERP or multi-tenant cloud ERP. So as you can see in this example of a single house as opposed to an apartment building with multiple units, a multi-tenant cloud architecture simply means that users share a common pool of resources. Most cloud ERPs manage its multi-tenant cloud architecture as a single discrete unit instead of managing an infrastructure for each client. So this allows them to efficiently manage all aspects of disaster recovery, security, backups, and things of that nature on a single platform rather than for each individual customer, giving us, again, those economies of scale, helping keep our costs down. Really, the, the ability to manage one complete system is at the heart of how cloud ERPs operate their services economically. 
Extending this principle, it really means that all customers run the same version of the software because the entire upgrade process is managed on their behalf. For cloud ERPs, that translates to added efficiency since we're only supporting one version of the software. And it's better for customers who no longer need to devote time and resources to planning, testing, and deploying upgrades. At all times, you're going to be on the latest and greatest version. And as you can see in this chart, the market share for cloud applications in contrast to on-premise applications is increasing very quickly. By next year, it is estimated that more will be spent on cloud applications than on-premise applications for the first time. And it's going to continue to rapidly gain market share because of all the benefits we talked about thus far today. All right, let's take a net look at our next polling question. Uh, and this is something that we covered in our last section. So it looks like the majority of you got that correct. It's 66%. Uh, so if we go to this next slide here, we'll see as, as reported by the Aberdeen Group, about 66% or two thirds of businesses are running old versions of um, or outdated versions of software for fear of upgrading. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what are some of the telltale signs that you may have outgrown your current accounting system. First of those is, if, is legacy ERP draining the innovation out of your IT budget? So the key to knowing how aligned your ERP systems are with your business imperatives is measuring how much of the IT budget is devoted to innovation rather than maintenance. So how much of IT's time can you devote to addressing new business requirements rather than day-to-day -day operations, such as those patches, fixes, and support calls we talked about, and otherwise managing infrastructure? Take a hard look at your aging version locked ERP system you're, it, you may be running right now and do the math. Analysts from Forrester to Gartner measure this allocation closely and find that maintenance spend can range from 50% to more than 90% of your typical IT budget. Only a fraction is left for meeting uh, your business needs moving forward. Any subsequent recurring maintenance fees, infrastructure upgrades, integrations, ongoing IT maintenance can quickly consume your IT budget. Simply changing the equation and reallocating the IT budget from maintenance to innovation is almost impossible with old ERP because every costly old uh, ERP upgrade, patch, and fix is what we would call opportunity cost. Money and time that isn't spent on tailoring your ERP to meet the needs of your business. We're still, as businesses have little left to managing their core areas such as security and reliability. Also, our, the business regulations we, we see today are really demanding, demanding fluidity in our uh, ERP systems. So accounting and regulatory environment is in constant flux uh, as governments tighten fiscal policy through sales and corporate tax changes, or accounting bodies implement strong str or more stringent requirements, such as FASB's new ASC 606 to come out several years ago, uh, AS 842, which has been recent, uh, and other sorts of things uh, that are going to govern how we are recognizing revenue for products and services. These sorts of changes put an enormous amount of pressure on finance organization. An out-of-date ERP is simply not to design with this change in mind. How could a SAP an install from 2005 ever known about these new recognition, revenue recognition changes that would be hitting in 2021 or before? The gap between your ERP and your current business operating environment is filled with spreadsheets and headcount. This is what we call the putty that fills the gap that your ERP was really meant to automate. Revric schedules suddenly migrate to spreadsheets. Local tax reports get massaged through CSV exports and manual entry and sales tax calculations start uh, becoming error prone affairs. The fact is, is that on-premise ERP will never track with this change as well as cloud ERP, because on the rare occasion you do upgrade, upgrade it, the operating environment will have already changed and spreadsheets and personnel once again rush to fill that gap. In contrast, our cloud ERP aligns, uh, aligns continuously with your operating environment. Uh, take the example of um, to, from corporate ERP to more of a, a consumer product like TurboTax. You're going to always have the most up-to-date um, information on accounting rules, tax regulations, and compliance standards. Um, all of those updates are rolled out regularly by that uh, cloud ERP vendor uh, as necessary. And while you sleep, your ERP is updated with the latest regulations and requirements. And the result of that is really less risk, less headcount, and more time spent on strategic objectives other than operational tasks. Is, a, is your aging ERP a drag on your business philosophy? 
know, talking a little bit more about mobility uh, or the expansion. You know, the web enables business to go global instantly, uh, reaching far more customers within um, a year or two, whereas it used to take a decade or more for that type of progress to happen. You know, some of today's fastest growing publicly traded companies like GoPro uh, are growing because they're not shackled to these uh, sorts of things that cloud ERPs or that uh, traditional ERPs will bring into play. Uh, so, you know, as the, taking that Gold Pro example, uh, you know, they've been able to expand to new distribution partnerships. Um, they've been able to deliver up to date stock information and, and uh, delivery date information to suppliers and distribution partners. Um, and the most important thing is they're able to do that um, to build that infrastructure in the space of just two years uh, because they went with a flexible cloud ERP platform that aided them uh, in their rapid growth rather than relying on on premise system that would have hampered their growth. So really your ability to, com to compete is diminished if you're running an old version of say Microsoft Dynamics Nav or Epicor that was designed for when businesses grew incrementally, country by country, market by market over years and decades. The old way of doing business really meant deploying multiple ERP instances and databases for each market, hiring IT in each of those locations, setting up offices, procuring software and hardware, and just a very burdensome uh, process uh, for IT and from a budgetary uh, and just a timeline perspective. Now, cloud ERP applications provide the engine to drive that growth, enabling businesses to lay down those applications footprint uh, for each country and subsidiary in weeks, not months or years. So cloud ERP spares businesses from being able to have to worry about scaling up ex expensive IT resources and large capital expenditures, um, you know, as you are expanding out, you know, either within uh, domestically or internationally. So let's take a uh, look at our next polling question. So what percentage of the US workforce worked from home either always or sometimes at the end of 2020? All right. So let's go ahead and pull up our answers here. And then we'll pull up a couple of uh, recent surveys that were done. So as we can see here, um, so based on uh, the 2020, what frequency of remote work was done in response to COVID-19? And so you can see from an always perspective um, be, uh, and a sometimes perspective, if we add those two together, we're at 58%. Um, but then even looking at remote workers preference post COVID-19, um, we're looking at 65% that will be um, wanting to either prefer to work remotely, um, either just as a preference or because of concern out of COVID-19. So that's almost two thirds of the workforce that is going to be um, having a preference to work at home at least some of the time, um, even post COVID-19. So how does that translate to cloud ERP? Probably already know the answer to that. Uh, mobile workforce um, battles immobile and outdated ERP. So the COVID-19 pandemic put rocket boosters on the need for uh, remote working. From the enforced lockdown to current fluctuating post-lockdown restrictions, the pandemic forced many people to work from home almost overnight. And despite some of the easing of this need, the number of people working from home is still significantly higher than ever before. So for many organizations, this created a need for either wholly remote capabilities or the able to offer blended options that can buy both remote and office work. The issue is not every company that needs to do this is currently able to. 75% of those participating in a recent Gartner survey had between 51% and 100% of their employees working remotely. 84% agreed that remote working had increased to such an extent their organizations, uh, in, in their organizations because of the pandemic. And nearly 85% understood that remote working is here to stay uh, even once all of distancing measures are gone. With a cloud ERP, you have direct access to business tools, functions, and live data from any device with internet access. This mobile access and insight to your business operations is available day or night from the comfort of your home, uh, and you and your team can experience uninterrupted connection and seamless collaboration as you work to meet your customers' evolving needs. So next, you know, not only are workers becoming more noble, but businesses as a whole are becoming more distributed. So to compete, businesses are looking to achieve agility and fluidity in their business structure. Um, kind of talking to a recent point, uh, in a globalized world, businesses need to be able to choose where work takes place based on costs, timeliness, and the ability to maintain and adapt that elastic workforce. Today's businesses are running operations in multiple locations, maximizing efficiency with offshoring and remote workers. Um, but last generation's ERP was not designed with this in mind, requiring those hefty Windows clients and heavyweight software at each location. 
Businesses want to decentralize while maintaining visibility and control, but old ERP helps uh, holds them back from achieving those goals. Also, is you, are you struggling to gather and report on real-time information? If you're running a legacy ERP, uh, like Sage Maz or Microsoft Dynamics uh, GP, you know the drill. Your business is running on spreadsheets and management reporting is often difficult and error prone exercise or done in third party tools. You've got employees dedicated to the job simply for reporting or reporting consumes the line share of their day. More often than not, it takes days to assemble bookings, uh, billings, backlog reports, or to complete periodic budgeting and forecasting. You're constantly struggling to unlock data that's buried in the ERP or other disconnected systems and spreadsheets. Amazingly, while businesses can, uh, you know, today measure per perform ad performance, marketing, can re marketing campaign responses, um, number of unique visitors to their website in real time, you know, core financial management reporting remains measured in weeks and business days. So really for us to compete, Business need, businesses need modern ERP designed for today's needs, not the years, uh, not the needs of yesteryear. So BI and other analytics tools should be a part of the native ERP experience. Uh, BI has to empower every employee with personalized KPIs like we talked about before in real time, enabling them to get down to that invoice behind uh, a DSO calculation um, gain, or gain visibility across multiple business units and create and share their own reports with other sorts of self-service tools. Uh, additionally, um, old ERP is, is not inherently designed to have interaction with suppliers, uh, your channels, or customers. So if you're running a legacy ERP like a Sage Mass or a Dynamics GP, um, you're going to have other sorts of issues here as well in terms of not having that visibility to give online portal access to suppliers, to you know, check on purchase orders or you know, vendor invoices, or you're working with channels to be able to come in look at updated pricing, or customers just to be able to log in and get information, real-time order information, tracking information, and things of that nature. So cloud ERPs are, are inherently designed to uh, not only provide data and self-service to your employees, but also to uh, other relationships in your business, whether those are suppliers, um, uh, you know, relationships in the channel or with other customers. And then lastly is, you know, uh, old ERP is a barrier between your employees and self-service. And this is really staying on the theme of mobility uh, and, and self-service. So um, can your employees enter time and expenses directly into the ERP or some end up uh, rekeying that information in for them? Can an accounting manager quickly implement a new purchase order process or do you have to wait weeks for IT to do it? Can your finance team easily change an invoice template or add another field to the customer record? If none of this rings true, um, that's something that uh, is an issue with your ERP system. Um, our traditional ERP were really designed when businesses were top heavy in general administration and when it was standard practice to have someone assigned to reking things like purchase orders or time and expense entries. Now, back then a manager could offload those that reporting to finance staff and you could hire another IT guy to make an ERP process change. Now, cloud ERP is really designed for lean businesses that use the power of the web to drive employee serve self-service, just as the web has securely transformed things like online banking and customer self-service systems. As banks have known for years, empowering your customers through self-service um, through the web increases profitability and reduces waste that goes straight to the bottom line. Employees who use the cloud gain self-service efficiencies that aren't available to achieve with traditional old ERP. They can submit that time and expense or POs, enter in receipts from their mobile device. Um, once those transactions are submitted, it's just a matter of online approval and it's going right to your GL. Uh, managing change is also self-service with those workflows we've talked about, you know, forms or schema changes that don't require a delay or an IT involvement. So <clears throat> what we've talked about so far, how has the role of finance changed over the years? Uh, how does cloud ERP help me support changing business needs? What are the fundamental differences between cloud and traditional uh, software from an ERP standpoint? And what are some of those telltale signs or things that you've seen that maybe uh, have indicated that you've outgrown your current accounting system? So lastly, what we wanna do is talk about how do you identify and evaluate the right ERP for your needs? So here at iBailey, when we're working with our clients through a software selection process, we like to focus on what we call the five Ps. <clears throat> so what are those five Ps of cloud ERP selection? So it's gonna be publisher. So who is the software vendor? 
uh, platform. How strong of a software platform is that ERP built on? Product, this is obviously the ERP software itself. Price, obviously we need an ERP that's gonna fit within our budgetary requirements or constraints. And then partner, who is gonna be helping us and supporting us through the implementation and the long-term relationship. So first let's talk quickly on the publisher. How do I know if this publisher is right for my business? How long have they been in business? Is this a startup company or a company that's been along, along, around a long time and is established? Is the publisher a reputable organization prepared to support that software in the long term? Do I need to worry about their focus from a software package or do they often discontinue their products? Do they have a history of actively involved in developing their software package and making investments in their technology? Are they consistently adding new features and enhancing the software? These are all important things to consider when choosing a publisher. Now let's talk next about platform. Is the software built on a secure, reliable, and flexible and open platform to support my business growth? So does the, for instance, does the platform have open APIs that allow for integration or, or am I going to be stuck in a similar scenario of a lot of traditional ERPs and have difficulty integrating? Are there pre-built integrations to best of breed app software applications? Um, so as for, for instance, you know, maybe there's a best of breed um, application um, for banking or for um, tracking of other sorts of things that's just not available um, in, in, a, in the system by default. Um, oftentimes the cloud ERPs or the other third-party vendors will actually develop pre-built integrations that are no additional cost and allow you to bring those two systems together. Uh, am I able to enhance native functionality to meet my business needs? So does this platform allow you to extend the system by adding functionality on top of what they've already developed? And then what kind of platform tools are available? Can I build workflows? Is there an integrated development environment? Um, are there, do I have the ability to add automations into the system to help about some of those things that we talked about earlier today? And then lastly, how reliable is the, the platform? Do they have uptime guarantees? Uh, do they have a history of being reliable? What are those guarantees for uptime to ensure I'm not going to be suffering from uh, frequent outages that we may uh, deal with from a, a, a traditional ERP perspective? Moving on, let's talk about the product. So uh, this is obviously very important. Does the product fundal fundamentally meet uh, my organization's functional requirements? Um, does they, do they support my core financial or my core functional needs? So probably as important as any of the things that we've talked about uh, of these five Ps, if the product isn't really geared towards supporting your business process or your business model, it may be, you may need to be looking for a different product. For instance, if I'm a distribution company, I'm gonna need robust features around inventory management, you know, uh, things of that nature. Does the product utilize best practices? So does it follow, you know, what would be considered standard business process? Or am I gonna to have to bend the system to adhere to generally accepted best practices? Uh, are, is that product referenceable? Uh, are, my, are any of our peers going to talk to us about it on, on their usage of it, uh, of companies that do similar things to you, that are of similar size? Do they give favorable reviews and experiences of their overall satisfaction with the application? And does this uh, functionality support my industry and does it have critical mass in the marketplace? You know, similar to the first bullet point on the slide, does, uh, is this product is something that's uh, going to support my industry needs? Um, the ERP may, uh, product may be reputable in your, and in your budget, but if you're in healthcare and the product was designed you know, pretty specifically for manufacturing, might not be your best option. Additionally, how many of these companies are using the product overall and in your industry? Your ERP vendor should be able to help you understand some of these things. And then price. So does the product pricing fit into your organization's budgetary requirements? How is it structured? Is it subscription-based or is it um, one of those rare ones that's more of an ownership model? Do you have to pay for upgrades? As we said, most of the time, cloud ERPs don't do that, but this is something that you need to ensure as you're evaluating these things. Are there any hidden fees? Are you gonna get charged more as you grow from a transaction standpoint? Are there different tiers to the product based on the, the volumes that you're going to be utilizing inside of the system? You know, are there tangible ways for me to calculate my return on investment? You know, oftentimes um, you aren't going to initially save money when you move to a new REP system um, because you're not going to necessarily cut staff or lay people off just because you found a more uh, efficient system. But you will save costs moving forward as you continue to grow because you won't have to add additional headcount, you know, as those things, uh, as you grow from a, a, a transaction perspective or into new markets. And then lastly, let's talk about partner. How do I select a partner to help me with my implementation? 
uh, you need to probably understand how many implementations has that partner completed. Are they a newly established partner or do they have a long history of successful implementations? Does that partner have specific uh, knowledge to the vertical? So uh, oftentimes partners have specific vertical, vertical expertise. Uh, for instance, here at Ide Bailey, we have what we call centers of excellence around major areas like manufacturing and uh, general business and software and services and distribution. People that, are, that do that day in and day out and understand the nuances of um, the, those specific sorts of industries. Now, is that partner also able to uh, produce references from satisfied customers? References are important to understand really the full scope of what that partner is going to bring from not only implementation to ongoing to support and conflict resolution. You know, these sorts of things are a long term partnership and part, uh, picking the right partner is critical to the success of your ERP lifecycle. Uh, and then the last couple of things is, does that partner have a proven methodology to help you set you up for success? You know, the methodology and an ERP and how that's implemented is critically important. How do they handle training? How about change management? What does the go live process look like? Make sure you fully understand what that methodology looks like and that you're comfortable with how they're gonna be implementing your cloud ERP. And then lastly, what level of resources um, is that partner able to provide? Are you gonna have junior or senior level resources? Do they have experience in your industry? What if there's personality conflicts? Do they have the ability to swap out resources? All these things are very important as you're selecting a partner that you're going to trust to take you through this journey. Now let's go to our final polling question. This is just asking you, when's the last time you've actually participated in a migration of a ERP or an accounting system? All right. So it looks like we have a, a, wide, a wide variety of responses there from never to um, several in, those, uh, in the past three, five and 10 years. So uh, just due to the time, it does not look, to, look like we'll have time to hop into a quick product demonstration. Um, we do, we'll have uh, contact information um, in terms of uh, if you do want to see a product demonstration of, uh, of NetSuite, which is the cloud ERP that um, uh, I Bailey here uh, supports. So if you want to be able to see that, please reach out and we're, we're happy to set up something for that. So hopefully through today's session, you have you know, learned about how that role of finance has changed and is continuing to evolve. You've been able to understand the benefits of cloud ERP and how it can support your changing business needs. Uh, learned what the fundamental differences are between cloud ERP and traditional software. Uh, identified some of those telltale signs that you may have outgrown your accounting system or are in need of moving to a cloud ERP. Uh, and then finally, understand some of the different ways on how to identify and evaluate the right ERP for your situation and for your organization. So I will go ahead and turn it back to over to Amy to see if there's any questions that we can answer. Well, there, okay, one comment kind of question. Modern cloud ERP sounds like the way to go. What's the downside of the cloud ERP? Yeah, um, so I, I would say there are, um, in, in our experience in working with, with clients, there sometimes are, are fundamental um, barriers to get over from a, a cultural perspective in terms of uh, having your data uh, stored in the cloud. So I know uh, some management teams uh, have the, um, just just have um, that kind of barrier to get over in terms of um, the, having that level of comfort of having their data stored in the cloud. So um, I, I would say that could be a potential downside just from a, a cultural or a management perspective. Um, you know, but when we, when we think about just kind of the, from a functionality perspective, um, you know, there are, you know, certain things that, that we see clients just wanting to stay on premise. So, uh, you know, if they have uh, additional uh, investments they've made in other sorts of technologies that maybe require those um, sorts of things to be on premise, then that, that could be a scenario in which they, they need to see, stay with an on-premise technology. But just in terms of kind of general uh, outlines, the, there aren't any large uh, downsides to cloud ERP unless you've made those significant investments in other things that do require an on-premise ERP. Perfect. Well, that is all I see right now. So with that being said, you guys can feel free to reach out to Ethan. We will send a recording link to you guys within a few days. You'll see that in your email. And we just thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Ethan. Hope you guys You're have welcome. a great day. Thanks, everyone.